good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you back to our National Hispanic Medical Association 26th Annual Conference in Chicago. Our luncheon plenary today is a focus on national health policy and NHMA future advocacy to learn from the lessons of Chicago and Texas, two of our, uh, I shouldn't say Illinois and Texas, two of our big Hispanic states in the country. We have two great speakers. And then we're going to have Dr. Buford, our core faculty for the NHMA Leadership Fellowship, moderate the panel presentations on policies for NHMA advocacy in Congress from the class of 2022 Leadership Fellowship. So our first speaker, Esther Corpus. She is the CEO of the Alivio Medical Center, probably one of the well, most well-known clinics here in Chicagoland. She uh, has over 30 years of experience in community health centers and hospital markets, was the Vice President of Government and Civic Relations for Vanguard Health Systems serving in a number of progressive leadership roles since joining McNeil Hospital in 94, Corpus led Vanguard's engagement in Chicago's diverse civic and community outreach initiatives. <laughs> Esther. Buenas tardes. Is everyone enjoying the great state of Illinois and our beautiful city of Chicago? Soy Tejana, my parents are born in Texas, uh, San Antonio and Harlington, so I'm in good company here. Um, so I, I'm gonna speak on a, a topic that um, really affects everyone across the country and that is the redetermination for those who are in state funded Medicaid plans, which I'm sure many of you have been hearing about, right? But this is a really, really, really important subject that um, many of us, you know, some folks don't even know about it. Um, I'm trying to find my slides here. So I call it the long and unwinding road because we're unwinding Medicaid, right? And um, so I've heard this, this um, call that uh, previously, I'm struggling here on my slides. Right, here we go. So the first thing I wanna do is, is to remind everybody about the public health emergency. So um, better known as PHE for, the, for those of you and the continuous uh, coverage that we have had during, during the pandemic. So just to refresh everyone's memory, on January 31st of 2020, the Department of Health and Family Services um, announced this public health emergency, right, which during the, the because of the pandemic, which really relaxed a lot of the financial uh, requirements for folks to enroll in Medicaid. And so like normally the process is you have to qualify, you have to be, you know, legal, you have to be um, able to apply for it uh, based on your legal status, and also um, a lot of financial requirements, okay? That was all relaxed during the pandemic. So as a consequence, a lot of people obviously enrolled, and, and that was good because um, many of our, you know, our communities really uh, needed that support during the pandemic, and so that was a really good thing. Um, now, this is a good thing, you know, when we looked at the numbers in 2022, uh, the number of in individuals here in the US uh, reached a, a record low of 8%. So most of the citizens in, in the country had some coverage, right? 8%, that, that's, that's unheard of. It's never been like that before. Um, now we're, we're going in the other direction, right? So as a consequence of the unwinding of Medicaid, um, there's an estimated 15 million individuals who potentially could lose their coverage. So we've gone from 8% to now 15 million that will lose coverage, okay? So I'm ringing the sirens here. I'm speaking to the choir. We're all healthcare professionals, we're providers, and we, we care for patients. So we need to really educate ourselves and educate um, 
you know, our patients. Nearly half of those individuals, 6.8 million, we expect that actually can still remain covered. So it's not like we should give up hope and that they're not eligible. Many of them still could retain their coverage. But it requires us to make sure that we um, continue to enroll them and that we, we talk to them and educate them on how to um, remain on, on Medicaid. So it's different in each state. I'm, I'm speaking mostly from Illinois because that is you know, what I'm most familiar with. In each state, I would recommend if you're, you know, Texas uh, has different um, a process for redetermination and different requirements. It is state by state. There's a lot of similarities, and one being that um, most folks are gonna get a letter in the mail. They're gonna get um, a packet that requires them to um, do certain things, you know, um, and again, each state is different, but the biggest issue is that we, we you know, a lot, of, a lot of our patients move around, and if we don't have um, a good address for them, a good phone number, they are not gonna get the mailing, and they're not gonna know, they're not gonna um, do the things that they need to do in order to stay enrolled. So it's so, so important that, um, you know, we have that good information. Now here in Illinois, people are gonna start getting letters May 1st, which is next week, right? Um, they will have basically 30 days to um, conform with whatever requirements are in their packet, right? And um, they won't fall off the rolls until July 1. So there is, there is you know, that little window where we can, we can continue to help them. Okay, so um, I pointed out that's how, that's how it will happen um, here in the state of Illinois. Um, we also have people that maybe just got enrolled this month. They are not up for redetermination until next year. So it's kind of a rolling system for 12 months, okay? Um, so that's, that's an important thing to, to point out. Um, here in Illinois, they don't want people walking into the Medicaid offices to enroll. They're gonna do it by mail, by fax, or by phone, okay? And they have this barcode system that they're um, using to um, complete those forms. So um, this is an example of the timeline. The first state any recipient could lose coverage because they're, they're no longer eligible will be July 1st of 2023 here in the state of Illinois. They also have in the state of Illinois, they have Group A, which are folks that have absolutely um, no income whatsoever. They're in Group A. They don't even have to redetermine. They're gonna get a letter in the mail and they will automatically remain on the roll. So they really don't have to do anything. Um, it's the ones in Plan B that have to prove their income, prove their, their immigration status, those sorts of things. Again, state agencies are using a variety of meth methods to get the word out. Um, these are some examples um, that we're using. Um, I can tell you at Alivio, we're, we're, we know um, which of our patients are on Medicaid. So we're texting them, we're saying, um, because I have to tell you, and I don't think my patients are any different than anybody else's in this room, when they get a letter from the government, what do they do? They don't open it. <laughs> Están asustados, you know, I don't blame them. So they put it aside, you know. That is, that is they can't do that. And we tell them, you have to open it and bring it, bring it to, to the clinic. You know, let us help you work through it. And that is the important message that you, we all have to tell our patients. And work with your other community-based organizations that, that have the resources, las promotoras. I have 30 promotoras who are out there every day at churches, um, talking to um, folks in the neighborhood because, you know, la comadre might not be on Medicaid, but, you know, her comadre might be on Medicaid. And she's like, comadre, you know, you know, you know, you know, pay attention. You're going to get a letter. You know, we have to. That's why. You know, regardless if they're on Medicaid or not, we we've got to spread the word and we got to educate our community. Um, we also have a lot of a lot of signs in our clinics, and we're asking all of our front desk staff when the patient comes in, don't ask them, "Has any of your information changed?" Because I hear them say that. No. What is your address? Because they're gonna get a letter in the mail, and if we have the wrong address, they're not gonna get it. 
and then they're not going to, they're gonna fall off the rolls and that would be, that would be really bad. Managed care organizations, so many of us are on you know, managed care plans, a lot of our patients are. Uh, in Illinois, 85% of the Medicaid um, eligible folks are on, are on some sort of MCO. So the MCOs have their own campaign. So we're, we're, we're getting, um, you know, we're, we're speaking to our patients on a lot of different levels. And so I would encourage you as well um, to use those resources. Um, and, and we have to, you know, we have to talk to our patients um, in, in different ways, right? So um, FQHCs, if, if you have an FQHC partner, we have a lot of resources. We do this all year, year long. And so I would, I would encourage you to work with your hospitals, other social service agencies in the community that can help you um, spread the word. And um, you know that, that's a huge recommendation that I would make to everyone in this room. Um, we're also doing here in Illinois and, and in other states monitoring. So we have, we've already started to um, create a, an infrastructure for how we can monitor you know, right now, you know, we're, we're gonna, our first monitor is gonna be in two weeks to see how many people we have effectively re-enrolled in, um, in Medicaid. So these are some resources. I think they'll, they'll um, share these with you. I'm not sure how that's gonna happen, but um, my, my phone number will be on there and I'm happy to help. Um, I'm getting the five minute warning here. Uh, special considerations is that uh, here in Illinois, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, is that we, we were the first in the country, Alivio Medical Center, Healthy Illinois, to pass Medicaid expansion for undocumented adults. First in the nation. We're very proud of that. And so we're really worried about them because, you know, they will fall off the rolls too. They have to go through the redetermination process, which is new to them because they've never had to do this before because the first bill we passed was, was four years ago. So they've never had to do it. So we're, we're really worried about those, those special individuals. Um, in Illinois, um, pregnant women and children are covered under Medicaid. I know not every state has that. Um, but they also, um, pregnant women are gonna also have to be rede redetermined here in Illinois. So we're really worried about them and folks with disabilities. Um, so again, these are some areas that we need to monitor, make sure that, um, you know, or, or these are things that, that our patients have to be concerned about. They, they may make a phone call, probably long wait times. Uh, they may not get the mailing. Um, they may mail it in and they don't get the mail. So these are all things that we need to monitor. Um, I'm just sort of reviewing, I make sure that you verify their, their home address, um, that they, don't ignore those state notices on eligibility. Make sure your staff is well informed about what's happening, that you go onto your state HFS website and that you know what the process is and that you educate your staff. And then, you know, I said work with your American Academy of Family Physicians because they have a lot of information as well. I looked at their website and it's state by state. I wanna talk a little bit really briefly about Healthy Illinois, I mentioned that. We were the first in the country to pass uh, Medicaid expansion. Um, this is the coalition. It's a coalition of about 100 community-based organizations. It was founded by uh, my mentor and the founder of Alivio, Carmen Velasquez. Um, when she retired in 2014, um, you know, I know that her work wasn't done and they said, Carmen, we still, every, not everybody has health care, so we gotta do something. So we found, founded Healthy Illinois, we had no money, it was me and her sitting in a conference room at Alivio, and we built power around community-based organizations, grassroots, legislators, and just having strong relationships because we want healthcare coverage for all. So I like to bring that up because this is our timeline. You know, 2014, we founded, it took us until 2020. We wanted everybody to get covered and they said, no way. So I said, okay, let's start with 65 and older, the oldest folks that need the care and the most expensive group, the smallest group, but the most expensive. Um, so we passed that in 2021, we did 50 and over, and then 42 to 54. We just had a call this morning with the governor's office to cover 19 uh, to uh, 19 to 41 year olds. So uh, more to come on that, hopefully by the end of this month, we'll have, we'll have everybody in Illinois covered. 
So that's what this says here. We're also asking for long-term care because we know that a lot of our, our families um, end up in nursing homes or need assistance after a stroke, all of those things. And, and, and we all know that that has been, that's a huge challenge for us, right? To provide that, that specialized care. So these are um, other resources. I'm happy to take a few questions. I know I'm, I'm, I've run out of time, but I'll be here for, for a little while if anybody has any questions about how we were able to create Healthy Illinois or um, anything about the redetermination process. I'm not an expert, but I do um, you know, work with, with folks every, every day that are affected by um, possibly losing their Medicaid coverage. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's so important to cover our undocumented families, uh, and I know many of our states with Latino patients are doing the same, so please help your policymakers understand the importance of that. Uh, next, we have a very, a very special story. This is uh, from Mrs. Mayela Casañon, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Community Health, De Health Development, Inc., in which you may not realize that this is a special clinic because it is in the city of Uvalde, Texas. And we are going to hear about Uvalde, Texas, the path forward after a community ravaged by gun violence and children in our community public schools being killed and teachers and police that were not very effective. Uh, had it, the, the story became a national news and how Latinos in this country are treated. And we need to have more respect for our communities. And I want to personally thank the Centene Corporation, which are right here, who own this company and are changing our communities one by one through their efforts. So thank you very much. And Ms. Senor. Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here today and share a little bit of our Uvalde community. Again, my name is Mayela Castañon, and I'm the CEO of Community Health Development. I've been with CHDI for 23 years, um, first as in my role as CFO and now as CEO. I'm a brand new CEO, and this was my COVID came three months after and then now the Rob incident or tragedy. CHDI is an FQHC. For those that may not know, FQHC is Federally Qualified Health Center, where the main purpose of an FQHC is to provide quality care to those in need, either uninsured, underinsured, or living in remote areas where health care is almost, almost impossible. CHDI is the only FQHC in Uvalde County. It started 40 years ago when individuals in our community realized that quality care was not available. Before CHDI, our community would travel to the border to be able to afford medical and dental care services. Forty years later, we have five locations, three in Uvalde, one in Lakey, Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with our area, Lakey, Texas, and Campwood, Texas, very rural, very frontier in Real County. If you ever want to go visit, it's beautiful. It's a tourist attraction. It's a small community. Uh, the whole county is about 3,000 in population. We are the only FQHC in a 45 mile radius, so you can see the need for an FQHC is very needed in those areas. In 2022, CHDI served almost 12,000 patients. About 8,000 of those patients are from the Uvalde town, which represents about half of the population of Uvalde. Our 12,000 patients that we served, it's about one-third of the Uvalde County population. 
So CHDI, if we were not there, it would be a dire need for patients to go somewhere else. And it's difficult. We're about 48, 78 miles or 80 miles from San Antonio. That's the closest place to get healthcare. CHDI started with medical services, lab, x-ray, pharmacy class D. Now we have a class A, but we do have a class D in every of our, each of our health centers. In 2001, we added dental services. Six years ago, we made a difference and brought behavioral health services to Uvalde. We have the only, well, before the incident, we, were, we had the only psychiatrist in a 90-mile radius other than San Antonio. And it's not because we don't need more professionals. We do. Recruiting for a BH was difficult. And it's so challenging to recruit in the frontier areas. You are a precious gem. You are a precious commodity. It's hard to recruit you. But if you're looking for one, please call me. <laughs> You'll have my name and my phone number there. <laughs> Uvalde is like any community in America, from Puerto Rico to Hawaii, from Hawaii to Puerto Rico, and in, anywhere in between. We are just like any other community. Except May 24th came crashing down on us. We could not believe that was something that we did not expect, and I don't know that anybody expects that, but unimaginable. It broke down our community. And as you mentioned, our, there's shootings all over the nation. I wish we didn't have to but the reality is there, is there. That day, we lost two teachers. The spouse of one of the teachers passed away a couple of days after. 19 young students, nine and 10 year olds, the ages of my granddaughters. 15 wounded, they're still struggling to survive right now, physically and emotionally. It has devastated the community, not only because of the shooting, but because of the way it was handled. There's no words to describe the pain. We're still coming trying to find our new normal. This month in May, it's gonna be one year anniversary or mark, one year mark. All those feelings are coming back again. The pain, the rage, and we still don't have answers. CHDI was impacted in many ways. We're in the heart of the community. We're less than a mile away from the Rob Elementary. I went to school there. My mom still lives there, but a block away. We heard the shots from our site. Our staff members, Two other staff members lost their daughter. Seven other lost nieces, nephews, cousins. But despite the pain, our staff 
and our community have pulled together. And we have picked up the pieces and are moving forward. We want to make a difference, hopefully avoiding this to happen again. This tragedy brought to light so many weaknesses within our healthcare system, our school system, our government entities. We cannot be the answer to everything, but we can make a difference in some way. As the previous speaker said, the patient that doesn't read the mail because of fear, because of not knowing what to do. The same thing happens. Imagine a patient, you diagnose, you prescribe, they go home, they get their prescriptions, but then they go home to insecurities, lack of food, lack of electricity, lack of water, lack of transportation. So how do we expect that patient to get better, to stay healthy? And on top of that, dealing with the emotional and pain from the rob, rob tragedy. With the strength of our staff, the support of the community, and the partners that came to our assistance immediately after the tragedy. Thank you, Santine. You came to us no more than a week after. And you're still there for us. In our path forward, we came up with a plan to address some of those issues that we identified that were there before, but this brought to light. The Multipurpose Community Health Center. The Multipurpose Community Health Center, it's a, plan, it's a building that will have, provide all the services that we now provide, plus have social services in one spot. So we don't have to be sending the patient from one way, end of the town to the other. Legal aid, to read those letters that come in the mail. We already have work working with them. Big brothers, big sisters, to mentor their, our youth. Working with our collaboration with the, the elected officials and the city, we're not gonna recreate. We're just gonna get them together and work together to help our patients and move forward. We're also partnering with universities. We have already signed affiliation agreements with Texas A&M. We're gonna have our first resident rotate to our, to our sites on June 12th. We signed one with Our Lady of Lake University to have their first LC LCSW rotate through our sites. St. Mary's University will have our first LPC. We've been busy. We've been busy trying to do all of this so that we can build a pipeline to bring all those professionals like you into our site and provide services. The plan also calls for a school-based clinic. We're already talking to the superintendent with the, the trustees of the school board to start a school-based clinic at our campuses. We're gonna have medical, dental, behavioral health services. Maybe at that time, we can identify those children with issues at an early age and be able to maybe prevent another event. If we had saved that child, we had reached out to that individual that committed this crime, we saved one person, we could have saved 19 children, two teachers. So our hope, small, but we're trying to do something to prevent what's going on. Mm -hmm. So our path forward, it's ambitious, but we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it with the assistance, with the help of partners like all of you and of course, Centine that has not left our way. 
we will never forget them. And they are the ones that are giving us the strength to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So much great to meet you. Yeah, I hope you get over it. Yes, please do. Please do. Thank you. You know, I have to say it. Latina power. La Raza power is in the house. And I have to tell you that it's very beautiful to hear the stories from the leaders that make it happen. So now to hear from our leaders, the Leadership Fellowship Program, Class of 2022, and their recommendations for NHMA to take to Congress more policies that can impact our communities just like we just heard from the two community health centers and their impact on their communities. Can we have the four presenters please come up? And Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, our core faculty member, will be moderating them. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's, it's very hard to uh, pick up from your story, if we're a very moving story, and I hope that um, moving into the next generation of leaders that you're calling for to follow in your footsteps will lift everyone's spirits and give us a sense to join your, your trajectory forward, which is what we all want to do is improve the future, so thank you. Um, I'm very delighted to moderate this set of presentations. This is a panel of the National Hispanic um, Health Foundation's Leadership Fellows Class of 2022. And I'd like to just maybe have all of the 2022 stand. They have designated these individuals to speak on their behalf, but perhaps let everyone stand and we'll give you a, a round of applause here as they get started. <laughs> and we have a little graduation ceremony right at the end, but I wanted to give them a shot. And they're watching, of course, to see that they're well represented. So I'm sure they have some questions. <laughs> at the end. Um, these presentations reflect uh, four topics that are key to improving uh, Latino health and the health of the Latino, broader health of the Latino community, criminal, climate justice, mental health, uh, workforce diversity, and COVID-19. Um, and these uh, teams represented by the individuals up here um, <clears throat> are the 2022 Leadership Fellowship Program. They have worked together for almost nine months. Um, virtually, which is a big challenge, I can tell you, and, and bonded in spite of that, um, really uh, meeting every Friday afternoon from 1 o'clock to 4.30, if you can imagine, over the summer and into the fall. So it shows you the commitment to um, gaining the skills that they need to take forward uh, them, their role in leadership. So um, they have they joined these to the teams for these four topics, and uh, they've been working together to research the issues to talk directly to key federal officials influencing uh, decisions about those issues in the Washington week that they had last fall, um, preparing for much more expanded um, and terrific issue papers as policy briefs really to inform NHMA and NHMA staff around the advocacy issues in these areas going forward, as Elena said. Um, and they have been forced to compress all of this work into five minute presentations. <laughs> Um, to you today uh, with, in very short and crisp PowerPoints, but I do want to acknowledge all of the hours and hours of work that have gone into this and congratulate the teams for achieving that help. Um, they're going to present these to you, and I'm going to introduce each presenter um, individually, and uh, they will present their five-minute PowerPoint. Um, then I'll come up and introduce the next ones, and we'll move that way. And then we'll ask you to hold questions to the end, because we want to be sure that you get a chance to hear all of the issues and all the presentations and then um, ask your questions. So our first presenter, I think I've already advanced your operation here. Um, our first presenter is Maria Carmenza Mejia, um, who is uh, associate professor of the Baylor College of Medicine, Department of Family and Community Medicine. 
Um, she's an associate professor there at Baylor and a board certified in preventive medicine and public health and addiction medicine. I think she's going to be recruited pretty soon. I think they're probably going to tell you this. Um, she's a clinical scientist trained to practice at the interface of medicine and public health, focusing on health disparities and social determinants of health. She's also an active advocate um, in the Hispanic Latino community, serving various community-based committees and an expert as an expert consultant and leader of community-based health initiatives. And she has received multiple awards, including 2022 Women of Excellence and 2020 Star Faculty Award for Excellence in Patient Care at Baylor. And her dedication is going to be very evident to you today. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the delicious lunch. Um, again, my name is Maria Mejia, and we here um, here to represent my team. We work very hard on uh, putting together a, a couple of key points about climate justice. Uh, climate ju climate change refers to the long-term changes or shifts in temperature and weather patterns. Um, usually caused for not, not natural causes, but for the last two um, centuries, uh, human activity have been the main driver of those changes. I'm not here to explain the science behind climate change, no, also not to uh, debate on uh, where you stand, but I'm here just as a call, a collective call for all of us to advocate for climate justice, uh, particularly for vulnerable population, in, including our uh, Latino uh, community. So air pollutants, including ozone, and particular matter, contribute to adverse events, uh, health effects. Uh, we all know um, we, we all know that there is plenty of data behind that to support uh, that a, a, the relationship between environmental exposures, climate change, uh, change like um, severe weather changes, like the flooding, uh, heat, um, and all the things that uh, um, develop when there is a tragedy, like vectors, like infectious diseases because of vectors, because of the um, uh, the, uh, the water that gets collected, also communities that are uh, located in heavily industrialized areas with manufacturers, the contamination of the water, and so forth. Uh, we all know that it has a negative impact on um, respiratory illnesses, uh, COPD, we there's a lot of data on cardiovascular disease, as well as obesity, metabolic diseases, and uh, infant mortality, um, and low birth weight. So, but what is important? Well, Hispanics are overrepresented in industries such as agriculture, construction, and manufacturing, which put them at high risk of not only exposures, but also to the uh, negative effects of um, climate change. Over half of the U.S. population, uh, Hispanic population, Latino population, uh, lives in areas uh, of, of, with a high degree of climate change threat, with, like I mentioned, flooding. Um, uh, heat uh, and so forth. Uh, all the this disproportional, the disproportionate environmental exposure to air pollutants and other environmental pollutants and toxins um, it sits, but we do know that uh, so there are certain members of that community that ha are highly exposed to those or affected to those and don't have proper prot protections or they don't have access to health care or there is just some cultural barriers to actually look um, or seek care for uh, the negative impact of uh, climate change and other exposures. Hispanics, uh, data shows that Hispanics are more likely to live and work in areas that don't, mean, uh, don't meet air quality standards. We have made a lot of progress in the last several years decreasing or improving the quality of air. However, there is still a lot of work to do, particularly reaching out to those who have been excluded from all this progress when it comes to improving the quality of air. Um, lastly, but I think very, very important in current times is the unequal access to information on climate change resources for mitigation and protective measures. Um, 
a lack of resources that are uh, not only linguistically, but also um, culturally uh, uh, competent with the, the way that we can reach out to our communities. One of the lessons that we have learned during COVID-19 um, is that our community needs a very uh, special tailored messaging, right? The, in order to get through our Latino, through our Hispanic community, we, they need leaders, experts, community experts. That's, and here we are. We have all this knowledge all together. So I'm inviting everybody to uh, advocate for and to be an advocate for advocacy. All advocate for advocacy, teach our kids, our children, teach our community members, our community members in the uh, healthcare system, teach our medical students, our uh, college students, high school, uh, the, the pastors in the churches, they are a great, great uh, source of um, uh, communication. How to um, leverage the current momentum that we have on reaching out to our communities, um, uh, amplifying the message, their community, vo the community voices to properly address our needs and also have access to all the resources. So finally, three pieces of uh, legislation have passed in the last uh, couple of years, super important. The American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Investment and Job Act Law, and of course, the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of money is in there, about 300, $367 billion over the 10 years uh, will be put towards the Inflation Reduction Act. One of the, the uh, largest um, uh, investments on climate change and environmental um, uh, health. But what can we do? Uh, in HMA. Well, we can get involved in uh, advocating how the allocation of those resources. Also, investing in getting involved with health literacy, community education, being able to deliver the right message to the right community, tailoring the tailored messages. Our Hispanic Latino community from New York, from California, and from Texas are very different. So we do need experts in every part of the country to be able to uh, to deliver those messages. Um, engaging and partnering with community-based organizations, grassroots organizations and governments to widespread, to use um, a communication, not only social media, but also broadcast media to educate about air quality, the resources that, that are there uh, that can be used. Teaching our community and grassroots organizations to write grants, there are block grants, plenty of money out there, but our communities serving our, com our Latino community Community don't know how to do that. So for those who are involved in that type of work in the nonprofit world, help them, help them to put together the applications and to have a, to bring those resources to the communities. And finally, just uh, educating our um, uh, uh, providers about the impact of climate change and the health of our patients. Not only those who are suffer for respiratory illnesses, but all type of chronic diseases. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our uh, next topic is improving access to mental health services and Maria Minguez is uh, currently serving as the Assistant Chief Medical Officer for Community Affairs at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. In this role, she's responsible for developing and strengthening existing relationships with uh, New York's Presbyterians communities, including elected officials, community-based organizations, community health partners, and community physicians. And I can't emphasize as a New Yorker how big this system is and how demanding that job is. She's been a faculty member um, since 2007, is appoint has an appointment as assistant clinical professor of pediatrics and public health at Columbia and the Mailman School of Public Health and is board certified in pediatrics and adolescent medicine. She's also involved in research evaluations of school-based health centers and some really important research that Claudia's been doing for a number of years in the Washington Heights community on the Dominican um, subpopulation as we've been talking about it of Hispanics. Um, she's also medical director of the Lang Youth Medical Program at Presbyterian, which is a six-year medical enrichment program for underserved junior high school students in Washington Heights. So, Maria?
Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Mara Mingus. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to actually learn how to improve health outcomes outside of our clinical space. I really appreciate that. Um, I am just a messenger standing over here on behalf of my amazing team. And this is actually a culmination of months of wonderful conversations and intellectual curiosity. So our group share an interest in mental health issues. And after thorough deliberation, we thought to just discuss and focus on access. Leveraging, of course, our great resource, which is technology. So the problem, the statement of our problem, 65% of Hispanic or Latinos with mental health needs do not receive services. And this is actually about, if you can see over here, it translates to about 7 million adult Hispanic or Latinos who actually reported having a mental health fitness. So this is a major issue. Why it could be a problem with access, also cultural stigma, as well as lack of insurance, or also a language barrier. Let me go back. Ooh. Here we go, can you see that? Okay. So, just to mention, the importance of mental health is actually at the core of well-being. Untreated mental health condition leads to increased morbidity and mortality, and that's a problem. The policies in telehealth actually have significantly evolved in the last years. So the pandemic has undoubtedly just accelerated the conversation. It is worth noting that I'm only gonna mention a couple of compacts because we only have very strict five minutes. So please understand <laughs> that there's a lot of conversation I'm going, but I will like completely go very quickly over it. So as you can see here, licensing compacts are ideal way for us to actually expand access. These are three different compacts that you can take a look over here. The Psychology Interjudicational Compact, the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, and Counseling Compact. And what is a compact? It's actually a legal agreement between two or more states for one professional licensed in a particular state to practice in the other member states. So also there's been a lot of activity in legislation, okay? And as I mentioned again, this is only several that we chose just pertaining because of time. So we have here, here we go, let me just. So this here, there's three different policies actually. What they do is they speak specifically in, on the purpose of geographic boundaries of telehealth as well as payment, payment parity. I don't think I have time to actually read each one of them because I see my two minute <laughs> warning. So NHMA, okay, you should advocate for Congress to improve mental health screening, access and treatment modalities via telehealth. Two different ways. Advocate for proper compensation, right? It has to be compensation. So we have to not just be a temporary issue, it has to be made a rule on permanent parity, payment parity, and also promote expanded licensure so that we in New York and any other state could also help people in Uvalde. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Seuss, maybe you haven't, but this is actually <laughs> a very insightful physician, um, <laughs> fictional. <laughs> Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it is not. And now I ask of each one of you to actually do something as well. I also have it asked for you. Please just ask your patients. Screen every single time. Thank you. Thank you. You can tell Mara has experience with policymakers who have a length of attention span probably less than a minute. So she did a really, really terrific job. Um, as painful as it might have been, anyway, I know, but well, well done. Um, Susan Gaita, Dr. Susan Gaita, is currently the Patient Safety Quality Officer for the Department of um, Emergency Medicine um, and an inpatient clinical informatics chair and assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine, MD Anderson Cancer Center, and previously worked in the Department of Critical Care and Respiratory, um, here, sorry, Respiratory, um, hold on a minute, my notes, I wanna get it right. Uh, 
respiratory care at MD Anderson for 10 years before moving into her current job. Um, she, our focus is on quality improvement as it relates to uh, sepsis and advanced care planning. Um, and her research efforts have really been collaborative to really advance the awareness about the risks, especially of sepsis, um, which has been very high profile, probably not high profile, high profile enough in recent years, um, but also advanced care planning. In her personal life, she has always been involved in leadership positions ranging from being class president in her medical school class, Northern California coordinator of the Chicano Latino Medical Association, uh, to highlight only a few of her previous leadership positions since we're talking about leadership today, all of which are aimed at giving back to her Latino community. Susan? When I started this, I'm gonna take a second from my own time, and I just wanna say, Hector and I were saying, after our speaker from Uvalde, si se puede, so come on you guys, si se puede. <laughs> we're there for you. All of us here, so you guys, I'm putting you guys on the spot. Okay, it's my pleasure to be here to represent my group and they're listed here just because of time and I really want to acknowledge Dr. Catherine Flores who is not here but she was our advisor. I mean she was there. I'm like Dr. Flores. She's like Susan call me Catherine. I'm like no, no, no puedo, no puedo. But she, I was like what can we do? But anyway, like with the previous speakers, we spent a lot of time sending emails back and forth and here is in five minutes the hard work that we put together. <laughs> Last year, if you guys were here, well not here, but in Washington DC, the prior group spoke on residency and you've always heard about medical school and you know, pre-med, how we had to get there. Well now we're gonna go all the way to the other side to Latino faculty. So there's our objectives, I have nothing to disclose. So how do we increase the number of Latino faculty and why is it important? Well we all know I'm preaching to the crowd. We provide the most care to Latino patients not only do we provide that care, we also serve as mentors and role models for our medical students, our residents, and our fellow Latino back, um, Latinos. And also, of course, for some of us that are lucky, we, we get to mentor our own colleagues. I'm proud to say, Dr. Loseo Margarita, we've known each other for a long time. She's now an assistant dean at, UC, at, UC, at Charles Drew. Yeah. I'm like, that is great, because now we can look to her and say, she's there at that table. So this is, not only do we mentor medical students, residents, but our colleagues, she's there, and I'm just so proud of her. You guys can call clap. She's in this California fellow. Yes, by the way, I am in Houston, Texas, but I am Ch Chicana and CMSA, and we were presidents at the same time. Unfortunately, this is the, the unfortunate part, we're only 3%. Latino faculty in the American medical schools. And I wanna call your attention to this picture here. Let's see, we have on there. We're all familiar, I don't know if this is working, but we always look at the other end, but if you look at this pipeline, the leaky pipeline, if you go all the way down to the end, faculty, un vasito, that's all we're at. So this is why National Science Clinical Association, we need you to advocate for us. This picture here, we're all familiar with the background. In 2050, 24% of the, of the uh, population is gonna be Latinos. Remember, we're only a small amount. We take care of the Latino population, and we're only 6%, so there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of studies, which I'm not gonna quote because we all know those studies that we take care, and then people from Uvalde mentioned uh, the, most of the Latinos uninsured or uninsured or you know, transit migrant workers. So there's been past and present programs that have helped to address this. When we were looking at this work, it was very hard to get current data. There was, I would look to the website, it was out, you know, not published, but these are, the, again, the programs that have worked in the past. Some of us in this room have participated in these programs. However, for the National Hispanic Medical Association, our recommendations are that you support a Latino faculty leadership program through HRSA, mm -hmm. so that way any of us can go we can't be, you know, I'm fortunate I'm at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I was talking to some of my colleagues last night. I get a lot of CME money. Some of our colleagues don't. So that's why we need HRSA to support, um, NHMA to support this. Also to have legislation to support loan repayment program and specialists for specialists. So we all, you know, went to medical school. We're going to work, you know, in underserved primary care. But guess what? What we learned from COIP, we need ID. We just heard about mental health. So we need all these specialists. We need surgeons to be there, so we also need that too. And then to increase funding programs in medical schools and academic health centers that focus on promotion and retention of Latino faculty. One of the things I bypassed on the slide, 
you heard I'm an assistant professor. I think all of us here, except for maybe one is an associate professor. My God, that told me how hard it was for her to get a letter of recommendation from an associate professor, because we're all assistant professors. So we need that help to get up to be a professor. So one day, we could all be professors that are in the faculty, okay? <laughs> so those are our recommendations. Gracias. All right, and our final presenter, Dr. Hector Cabrera, joined Premier Health in 2019 after having served in the urgent care field as an owner-operator since 2004. Dr. Cabrera earned his medical degree from Tulane School of Medicine as an MPH uh, and tropical medicine from that school as well. He completed his residency in family medicine at the University of New Mexico and served as a National Health Service Corps scholar um, in an FQHC clinic on the west side of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he's been very involved in um, uh, medical missions in Latin America, um, including a VIM mission uh, to Reynosa, Mexico, for whom he served as team leader. So you see the diversity in our leadership group. So Dr. Carrera will talk about um, equitable access and utilization of COVID-19 treatment in the United States. Good afternoon, everyone. Five more minutes and when we're done. <laughs> um, you know, as my, as my freshman, uh, freshman and youngest daughter likes to say, Dad, we're so over COVID. Um, but I want you guys to put yourself in our position one year ago when we gathered as fellows uh, in DC. Um, you know, what the climate was like back then. It was right around the time when optimism was growing because of the effectiveness of the vaccines, the effectiveness of monoclonal antibodies, and then the new arrival of the oral uh, antivirals. So we're gonna, we focused our project on equitable access and utilization of the COVID-19 uh, oral antivirals. I wanna thank our faculty advisor, Dr. Susana Morales, for her guidance and input. I have no disclosures, so. Over 104 million cases of COVID and counting. 1,130,000 deaths. You know, Hispanics are the second largest uh, percentage of deaths. The CDC estimates about 33.4% of those deaths were in Latino community. Um, yet we only make up 18% of the, of the population. Now, we know that um, you know, most of us here and most of our colleagues have felt that loss in one way or another, either from loss of one of our patients or our families or a neighbor. You know, I myself, I lost one of my tias, my madrina, during this. And although COVID did not create this uh, inequity, health inequity that exists, um, it did expose it and perhaps it magnified it. During that time, several of my uh, colleagues that are in clinical practice, we noticed that there were probably less of our Latino patients seeking treatment or with knowledge of these COVID anti um, therapeutics. I think that's why we wanted to focus on this. Now, while, while uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, had been around, uh, the test to treat program was launched in March of 2022. We had the privilege of, uh, of interviewing and getting to know Dr. Meg Sullivan, who's the CMO of ASPR, the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. They've been tasked with administering this program. Uh, this program, its intent was to make things easier, faster, better uh, with treatment and, and testing for this. Uh, if a symptomatic patient presented, they could be tested, there was access to a healthcare provider that could uh, evaluate that patient and then treat uh, with a COVID antiviral if, uh, if indicated. Um, 
the administration, the uh, Biden-Harris administration, did make clear their mandate to, to try to reach the most uh, vulnerable populations. And ASPR uh, initially set their test to treatment sites in pharmacy-based clinics, FQHCs, other community health centers, and then long-term care facilities initially. You know, their goal was to reach the most at-risk community. But despite these efforts, there, there early on uh, became to be evidence, uh, became to be evident that maybe um, these antivirals, these treatments were underutilized in the communities of highest vulnerability. There was a study that was published in June 2022 in the MMWR that showed that there was dis decreased dispensing rates in uh, zip codes that were designated by the CDC as being of highest medical vulnerability. Uh, there was a second study then in October of 2022, also published uh, by researchers in MMWR, uh, that showed a decreased prescription rate of Paxlovid. This was done by analysis of EHR records in over 700,000 records. Um, there was a 30% lower rate of prescription for Hispanic and Latinx patients that were COVID positive compared to their white counterparts. So ASPR did respond to try to increase access. Uh, they expanded um, to allow uh, test to treat in standalone, which some states initiated, standalone sites. They allowed um, uh, pharmacists to prescribe and they expanded their access uh, with telehealth uh, consults. We thought there were, there's value in analyzing uh, this policy and to learn best practices. So our recommendations to the NHA, uh, NHMA, um, the NHMA, NHMA should advocate to Congress for the following. Legislation to educate healthcare workers about COVID therapeutics, perhaps creation of a national medical provider education program, allocation for federal funding, to develop multilingual and culturally sensitive community communication campaigns uh, for COVID-19 treatments, like maybe has been done for the Vaccinate for All campaign. Legislation that provides funding to state health departments, which supports the training of community health workers, or promotoras de salud, and perhaps creation of pricing guidelines for manufacturers. Um, so that COVID-19 treatments remain affordable uh, for our uninsured community members. Uh, there's only 13 days left till May 11th and the end of the public health emergency. And so there's challenges that lie ahead in the near future and in the far future. And we think that NHMA is in a unique position to kind of foster and leverage perhaps that win-win relationship between the federal government its agencies, and us that care for the Latino community. Thank you. And now we're, we're running on the edge, but since all of these folks were disciplined enough to present to you in five minutes, I'm going to give you five minutes to ask them questions. Because I assure you they're just as good on their feet as they are in presentation. So there's a mic here and a mic there. Are there any questions people have? I guess you were all convinced. Oh, yes, please, <laughs> if you want to step forward. Mm -hmm. Can you want to go to the mic, maybe? Go to the uh, microphone, please. They're right here and over there, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Marquez, can you expound a little on the repayment of student loans for specialists? Oh, Dr. Gaeta. Oh, Dr. Edna, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm like, oh, oh. thank you. Um, so what we, what the recommendation is for NHMA is 
you guys are all familiar with the loan repayment. So if you go, if you decide when you're in medical school to become in primary care, you know, a family practice pediatrician, uh, you can get loan repayment. Well, if you become like an ID doctor, which COVID has taught us that that's a great need, you can't qualify for that loan repayment. So what we're advocating for NHMA is to go to the federal government and say, hey, we need loan repayment for specialties. You know, surgeons. I mean, if you have appendicitis and you're in your body, you know, it's not going to do any good if there's a surgeon 200 miles away. You're going to die. Remember, my set, my, I focus on sepsis. Time is money, or in this case, time is life. And so that's what we're recommending for all specialties. Thank you. Let me, I've, I'm going to, because of the five minute limit, I'm going to see if there are other folks, if you don't mind. That's great. That was a really important question. I think we I'll don't, be around. we don't well, often think about the, um, the shortage of surgeries, especially in mental health, which is another issue yes. here, mm -hmm. and in pediatrics. So, other questions that people have? Yes, please. Run to the mic. <laughs> you have two minutes more for the audience questions. Here we go. <laughs> Um, hello, thank you all so much for bringing up those uh, very important points, but uh, what I want to point towards too is the repayment plan. I'm a medical student, I'm a DACA medical student, and DACA students do not qualify for repayment programs. Ideally, I want to specialize, so I think uh, we should keep in mind the undocumented students that are in medical school, because DACA continues to be politically challenged every two years, and it's a political swing. I think those conversations need to be included, to be included in those repayment plans. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you so much good. for bringing that up. Thank you. That's a good point. That's and the reason I didn't emphasize DACA is just because this was, ours was a narrow spec for Latino faculty to retain them. And that was why we were looking at medical school. But yes, I agree. I want to say another, uh, just as a person in the School of Public Health, it's a similar issue for any kind of financial, federal or governmental financial assistance for DACA students. So it's a huge problem in general. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Um, I was. Can you introduce a, yourself? Oh, okay. I'm Marianne Ramos. I'm a physician assistant associate. And actually, uh, I'm a medical reserve. And uh, we've, we must have heard. Uh, health for all folks, because I was taking care of folks after they were discharged after for COVID-19, and one guy didn't want to go back to the hospital because he had 104 temperature, and he wouldn't go because he was afraid they would send him to the, back to his home country. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, his wife and I talked him into going. He got bacterial meds in addition to the viral, and he got better in two days. That's so good. we need to really in reinforce the herd health for everybody yeah. that's here in the country. Thank you very much. I think what your, your question links to the panel, but also to the other speakers, the beginning speakers that we're talking about, Medicaid mm -hmm. issues. Over here. So, one more question. One more question, all right. It's not on. Is it work? There you oh, go. Yeah, uh, there you hi, go. hi, really short. Diego Verano uh, from Houston. Now I'm moving the next month to California to start my residency. <clears throat> so I came from Texas. So guns there are kind of uh, popular. So the question is about that. Like, uh, uh, do you have like uh, uh, the Hispanic, uh, uh, I don't know, congressmen and women? Any kind of uh, like strategy like uh, besides the endless uh, fighting between the two parties? Thank you very much. I think we, we don't, we didn't have an initiative on gun violence, but I think we may need to do that for next year. I don't know if any of you have one to comment in general or not. Okay, one prescription on the list for Elena, for the fellows for next year. We'll get a, the 2023 team, you can figure out what you're going to work on now. So yeah. anyway, so we have to wrap up. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry. Oh, all right. I'll be quick. Yeah. My name is Claudia. I'm with the Arizona Latin American Medical Association. And my question uh, to NHMA is, is there anything that is being done to support state and local Latino associations thrive? Okay, I think this is an important yeah. question, not necessarily related to this panel discussion. If we could, maybe you could talk offline with Elena. I know it's okay. a big priority for NHMA, so thank you for that. Um, you want you know, do the continuing medical education, remind you that you need to fill out the evaluation form and use the code there in order to get CME. Um, it's very important, and I'd like to, um, just ask all of the 2022 fellows to come up and stand in the front, and we won't, we, because of time, we won't hand out their uh, certificates to them while you wait, but I would like you to give them a round of applause as to the, and to the panel. Thank you. Let me just uh, mention this. 
Please ask everyone, come up, all the 2022 fellows. Please come to the front. This is, well, why don't you go down there? We'll go down there, that's fine. Yeah, thank so, you very much. Uh, I wanna just, uh, housekeeping, uh, uh, three things. The evaluation again, please. The back side of your badge has the microsite with all the pictures and bios of our speakers. Uh, and at the registration table is our membership survey. We're very, very interested in getting more of your feedback on increasing members. And let me just give a, a, a very uh, strong thank you to Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, who's helped us with this program since the beginning. <laughs> and to our leadership fellows, uh, the National Leadership Fellows Class of 2022, We, we started today our orientation, or yesterday, our orientation for the Leadership Fellows Class of 2023. You want to stand up? Class of 2023. I think there's, a, there's some more over here. And we have a very special announcement. We are now starting the California Leadership Fellowship. And can those that are here, can you please stand up? They're here. We were able to find seven leaders in California that are going to change the state, the state's legislature in California. But let me just say to all these fellows, thank you very much for your recommendations. And we are meeting with HRSA about the importance of changing faculty development. And here's the key. The HRSA Biden administration has put in money to start funding the training of providers from underserved areas. So you know what? I think that's the key because we're all from underserved areas, no matter whether you're gonna go into primary care or specialty. And with the race neutral admissions that are gonna be changed by the Supreme Court, we have to find another way to redirect the funding from the federal government to our training programs, and that's the key. The other issues, the environmental health, we're working very closely on climate change. We, we are a partner with uh, NRDC, the Environmental Justice Fund, we're, we're very much involved with climate change. We will take your recommendations. And with mental health, of course we do mental health because we just heard from Uvalde and how important mental health is to our communities. And technology, of course, is, is, is another key. And um, in terms of COVID-19 and the Medicaid unwinding, we heard the tremendous story of what's happening here at Alivio Medical Center in, in Illinois and how all of us need to tell patients to open up your mail. And, and we definitely need to tell patients about the importance of being insured and helping each other understand the, the importance of insurance because even though we're finding states are now looking at our undocumented and helping our communities to have insurance, if they don't apply or if they don't know about how to continue to, to uh, uh, fill out applications, what's the use? So we have, to, we have to help our communities. So thank you very much. And these are the leaders of the future. We nominate our leadership fellows to national and regional uh, advisory committees. We, we nominate them to be speakers. We nominate them to be leaders. And we hope that more of you will join NHMA to join us in leadership development for the future and for the United States. Thank you very much.